Right. I thought I had to mention this because Ogilvy went through an absolutely massive uh, rebranding campaign, which, like all rebranding campaigns, takes a lot longer than it should. But in my first ever foray into making a kind of corporate message, um, what I thought I'd do is I just thought I'd say that the whole point of creating one Ogilvy, that there's one entity, is, and I'm going to make a promise to you, and the reason I'm making the promise is not because I'm absolutely sure we can deliver it or fulfill it, but because by making the promise, I increase the likelihood that the promise comes true. Something said, that's how advertising works. It's probably how marriage works to a degree, okay? And what I want us to be better at as Ogilvy when we're one entity is solving what I call Sudoku problems. Now, I don't know how many of you do those. Think of a crossword as a sort of vague analogy. It's a crossword for nerdier people. But the thing about a Sudoku is you can't practice division of labor with that kind of problem. You can't cut one in half and hand different parts of the problem to different people and solve it. It's only solvable if you see the whole picture. And my contention is that what we should be able to do, and if we're not doing it in five years' time, come and tell me and shout at me, is we should be better at solving problems because as one entity, we can now look at the, whole, the problem in its entirety rather than uh, little fragments of a problem which on their own. I often find marketing problems a bit like doing a crossword. If you can't solve three across, try and solve two down and see if it helps. And I think the same thing applies to solving what you might call complex problems in real life. And the particular role I think of Nudge Stock is very simple. I found the t this book and then found that the book was fascinating. Um, our job is making brands matter by making social science matter. Uh, ben Flyberg is actually at the Side Business School. Um, I think I'll try and invite him to Nudgestock next year. In fact, we better be quick because he's Danish, and so it won't be long before he's brutally murdered in a dimly lit underground car park. <laughs> now that's, that's the impression I get of Denmark from watching TV. Might be availability bias, I'm not quite sure. But uh, we'll invite Ben. But he has a very interesting take on social science, which is he says that it's struggle to become a science is at some level inimical to its adding social value. Because what you're doing when you try and make something a science is you look for universal, context-free laws. So the great success of the physical sciences is the laws of gravity or the laws of motion behave pretty similarly in Vancouver and in London. You know, there's slight gravitational difference between different places, but by and large, the laws of physics aren't location-dependent, they're not context-dependent. Snooker balls move the same way on a table wherever you are in the world. Uh, cricket balls move slightly differently when they're thrown by Australians, but that's a detail, Sam. Um, but um, if you look at it, if you reframe things, the great lesson of behavioral science, the great worry of behavioral scientists and people in the social sciences is the replication crisis, which is that a lot of experiments don't faithfully replicate. And my argument is, actually, as marketers and as practitioners, weirdly, it's the failure to replicate that we're really interested in. The fact that tiny contextual differences can make something true or not true, that's what marketing's about. It's finding the context in which a behavior feels natural and habitual rather than, the context, rather than the context in which it feels weird. So the famous example of the replication crisis is, of course, the famous Barry Schwartz jam experiment. And what he found was that quite often, in, it, it's an absolute axiom of economics that the more choice you have, the more likely you are to buy something because the greater the opportunity there is to maximize your own jam utility, okay? And what Barry Schwartz found is that in certain situations, at least, if you have too much choice, people don't buy anything because they can't confidently decide. And a lot of people said, well, we've tried it and it doesn't always replicate. And they go, oh no, oh no, we're not really scientists, are we? Now, as a business person, I go, that's fine. I just need to know that the way you design a choice has a big effect on how people choose and whether they choose. And I need to know also that sometimes the logical economic assumption isn't true. If you think about it, okay, if you're in a fairly hurried state, having to choose between 27 different jams, it's not going to happen. On the other hand, if you've driven 27 miles around the North Circular to visit a place called World of Jam, okay, you're probably not going to walk in and go, oh, Jesus, there's just too much jam, I can't cope, I can't make a decision. <laughs> now, I think with British Airways, who I think are here today, we experimented successfully with reducing choice. So when they have a winter sale, don't mention all 29 destinations, because you can't choose which of 29 cities you want to go to, particularly as you're going to go to with somebody else. 
I mean, getting you and your partner to agree on one of 29 cities is basically never going to happen. On the other hand, you might say, don't reduce choice, redesign the choice. So if you look at Starbucks, there are potentially 85,000 different drinks you can order in Starbucks. Now, if Starbucks adopted the same menu design as a Chinese restaurant, they would hand you a, she you know, a sheaf of paper about eight inches thick, and you'd come back three days later and say, I want a number 23,473. Now, Starbucks don't do that, and by making choice take place in stages, they make it easier. So maybe the next test with the winter sale is to actually say, OK, skiing destinations, interesting city breaks, and to partition the choice that way to make it manageable. And so it's an interesting question about the interesting symbiotic relationship between the behavioral sciences and marketing. That The most interesting thing about marketing is the very thing that logic tries to remove. What logic's looking for is universal consistency. OK? Actually, in the real world, if anybody did discover a universal law of human behavior, of course, the marketing community would have to have them killed because we'd be out of a job. What we're actually interested in is the very inconsistencies that social scientists find most, most frustrating. And it's very interesting. This is a passage from Bent's book. And it quotes an excellent um, anthropologist, French anthropologist called Bourdieu. He says, look, actually, context is basically everything in anthropology. Gift giving is generally a nice thing in the right context. On the other hand, if someone gives you a present and you return it, that's not a gift, it's not even neutral, it's an insult. So tiny contextual differences make a huge difference to how things are perceived. And I've got a few examples of this. My famous example is, for years I've been landing on, at airports, and when the engines wind down, when you're kind of a mile from the terminal, and everybody on the plane goes, oh shit, it's gonna be a bus. You know that experience? Oh shit. And then once I land at Gatwick and the pilot says, I've got bad news and I've got good news. The bad news is we won't be able to get an air bridge because there's a plane blocking our gate. The good news is that the bus will take you all the way to passport control so you won't have far to walk with your bags. And I looked at my companion and said, hold on, that's always true, isn't it? I'm actually glad there's a bus, but you never before gave me the context in which I could post-rationalize it as a plus. It's called adaptive preference formation. And so... How you actually present something can actually change something from being shit to being a bit of a bonus, entirely based on the context in which you judge it and the context in which it's presented. And that's the most interesting thing in the world to marketers. I'll give you a couple of other examples. I was asking a question in today's Spectator. If you look at student loans from one perspective, they're a brilliant way that mean that everybody can afford to go to university. But they're also, when you look at it from someone else's perspective, a weird thing that forces people to go to university in order to get a job, even if they don't want to. Because when you don't have an excuse for why you didn't go to university, not going to university makes you look like a subversive, dangerous troublemaker or loser. OK? The perspective thing, London housing. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Okay? The standard laws of economics would suggest that as London houses get more expensive, people take the win and they move out to the country, taking the financial gains because it's no longer worth that amount of money to live in London. What actually happens when prices go up is half the people actually, even if they want to leave, they can't leave because they're frightened of missing out on future gains or they think that once they leave, they'll never be able to move back again. Now, if you look at that, OK, the crude oil market probably works pretty much like economists predict. When prices go up, more people sell, more oil gets discovered, more oil gets pumped. It probably is an equilibrium market. The property market, at least some of the people, and maybe the majority, behave in exactly the opposite way to how economics would predict. So the impossibility of universal laws, as one very crude physics, physicist, a brilliant physicist said, imagine how difficult physics would be if atoms could sink. So maybe the very universality and scientific status that the social sciences are, are looking for is actually never going to be found. What is going to be found is some fascinating stuff about how context affects behavior. I've got two examples. The Craven form, formulation, Paul's over there. This is, by the way, worth the admission ticket alone. Paul Craven... Um, a very good friend of mine and a brilliant doyen of the behavioral sciences. He owes half his career success to a particular formulation of a request. Now, all of you have done this, right? You've got a colleague and you want to ask them a question, and, or you want to ask them a favor. And 
you don't give much thought to how you phrase the question. One of them might be, sorry to dump this shit on you, but... Or, I wonder if you could do me a favour, or whatever. Okay? Paul says, don't use any of those. Say, say, he says, the phrase to use is, I wonder if I can help you. you can, I wonder if you can help me. If you phrase it like that, there's a raise in status to the person hearing it, because they, you, they feel they've been chosen. It's very difficult to say no. And you've positioned them as someone actively helping you, which is a status gain. Sorry to dump this shit on you is a status loss. In the monkey brain, to, to, to ordinary grammarians, they seem remarkably similar. To the monkey brain, they're totally opposite. And yet tiny... There's a very important question with market research, by the way. No market research company I know does this. But if instead of saying, we want your opinion, you say, we'd like your advice it completely changes the nature of a research question. And so what I'm saying is these contextual variations are the absolute frustration of behavioral scientists, but they're actually meat and drink to us. The reason I mentioned the Western Chronicle is it's my local paper, Chartwell, where Churchill lived, happens to be within the, the bounds of Westrom. And I was once reading my local paper, and a man had sold on eBay a coat that Winston Churchill had given to him when he was a young gardener. And my local paper referred to Winston Churchill as the former Westerham resident and wartime prime minister. <laughs> and I realised there is no other publication in the world where you would put those words in that order. What's significant about Winston Churchill? He used to live in Westerham, apparently. So Maybe we ought to... Ah, sorry. This is one of the most interesting things of all, which is there isn't necessarily a right way of doing things. What a lot of humour shows is the right behavior in the wrong context. If you look at really, really funny jokes, what they often show is someone behaving in one context, which is appropriate in context A, totally inappropriate in context B. So this is one of my favorite little 10-second clips from Airplane. You'll remember this. There's a plane coming in to land with a very inexperienced pilot, and the man in charge of air traffic control is an ex-military guy. Maybe we ought to turn on the searchlights now. Oh. It's just what they'll be expecting us to do. Now, if you think about it, that's the right guy in the wrong job, okay? He's thinking like a military guy. He's thinking like a game theorist. You don't want a creative experimenter or a game theorist in air traffic control. But equally, you don't want a procurement person in marketing, okay? Military strategy, if you think about it, it's impossible in military strategy to be strictly rational or efficient because as soon as you do that, you're predictable, Okay? If procurement had been in charge of the D-Day landings, they would have insisted they took place between Dover and Calais to minimize fuel costs. So there are certain modes of thinking that are appropriate in certain settings, which are totally inappropriate in others. What's happened in business is business, a bit like the social sciences, has basically only got one mode of mental activity, which is let's pretend this is science. Let's pretend everybody's rational. Let's pretend that, um, uh, you know, that shareholder value is a really sensible model for uh, orienting a business. Okay? And all they have is basically a kind of physics fetishism where they're trying to replicate on a business spreadsheet the kind of same context-free certainty you get everywhere else. Now, you can see why management are tempted by this. Because management are at a level where they don't know the specifics, so they need generalities. And so the generalizing rule is disproportionately appealing to senior people because it frees them from the obligation to understand context. It can, I would argue, be incredibly dangerous because you have a whole management caste now who all think the same way. And so this is probably one of the most important lessons. Most people, if you pretend something's a science, you assume there's right and the opposite of right is wrong. Actually, in coming up with marketing ideas, the opposite of a good idea may well be another good idea. What, what are the most successful retailers? High-end retailers, bargain retailers. It's the middle that's suffering. And that isn't to do with demography or distribution of wealth. It might just be to do with the fact that we get a hit from getting a bargain, and we get a hit from an extravagance, but we don't get an endorphin rush from mid-market compromise. It's perfectly possible that the same two things which appear to be opposites can actually both be brilliant ideas. And that's one thing that makes marketing activity fundamentally different from conventional scientific activity. But the more you pretend to be a science, the less you actually acknowledge this. So what I'm asking you to do today is don't look for rules, look for patterns. 
If you think about it, behavioral economics got started because of the happy accident that Tversky and Kahneman happened to share a coffee room at Stanford with the economics faculty. It was actually the interplay between two disciplines was much more interesting than either of the two disciplines in isolation. And in the same way, the reason Nudgestock encourages people from such a diverse range of backgrounds is precisely that reason. That common patterns, which make perfect sense in one context, maybe you can borrow them to understand something apparently completely different. And the reason this becomes more and more important I, I have a total f obsession with things being dishwasher proof, okay? I don't see the point of having anything that isn't. I, mean, I want to apply that to things like children, okay? If you can't put it in the dishwasher, you don't want it. And I explained to my wife, I've got a really good solution to this problem, which is if you treat everything in your home as if it's dishwasher proof, in two years' time, it will be. <laughs> it's kind of dishwasher Darwinism when you think about it, okay? Now... My argument, and a huge thanks to Kevin, uh, who's sitting over there, for coming up with the less ordinary line, which combines British understatement with a very, very good description of the value of creativity. Most problems that persist in the world are either unnoticed or unsolved because they're logic-proof. Or to put it another way, if there were a logical answer, we would already have found it. There's no shortage of McKinseyites, there's no shortage of accountants, there's no shortage of people with spreadsheets, okay? If the problem has a logical solution, which some problems do, it probably wouldn't be a problem anymore. The problems that persist are the ones that are interesting because they defy conventional logic in some way or another. And I often say for this reason, you know, I'm not that worried about the Brexit vote, because I go, well, 48% of people think one thing, 52% of people think another. Two things you know about that is there are probably arguments on both sides, and at least we're arguing about it. Okay? The things that really worry me in business, and if you go to the Cannes Advertising Festival later, the inferior version of Folkestone, in my opinion, <laughs> you'll see exactly this. People, if you think, if you think the people working at Condé Nast are fashion victims, they're nothing compared to uh, marketing conversations at Cannes. Seriously, if you want to hear the same words repeated over and over again, it's much cheaper to become a Buddhist, to be absolutely frank. <laughs> and what worries me is you get questions like, I think that, art that big data is essential to developing future marketing breakthroughs and the pursuit of marketing. And you ask that question, 99% of people say yes. Now, that worries me much more, because now we're not even thinking. We're just chanting, right? And what happens with things like big data when they become fashionable? Because they help things look scientific, is, and they, they have an appeal because, wow, I'll have numbers, so I'll look like a scientist, and no one ever gets fired for being logical. Never forget that. Much easier to get fired for being illogical than it is for being unimaginative. Okay? So because of that, nobody's even asking questions about the downside of big data. Now, I've done a bit of research on this, Big data was behind the fall of Nokia, and it was behind the failure of Hillary Clinton. You notice that everybody, when they were unhappy with an election result, they went to Cambridge Analytica and thought that big data must be responsible for this weird win. Because they're fetishizing data to such an extent, it never occurred to them that big data might have been responsible for the loss. There was a crazy guy called Robbie Mook who ran the Clinton campaign. He was obsessed with saying things like, uh, my data contradict your anecdotes, and patronizing things like that. And he said that to, of all people, Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton, towards the end of the Hillary campaign, was saying, I think you really need to go to the upper Midwest and connect with white working class voters. And Mook parodied a Grandpa Simpson voice for Bill Clinton to ridicule the idea that Bill thought he knew better than his sophisticated data sets. But I think we can confidently say that, first of all, whatever you think about Bill, he's a marketing genius, right? Okay. Secondly, that Bill said, go to Wisconsin, which they lost, unbelievably, on the last day. You must go to Wisconsin. Nope, the data said, go to Arizona. Okay. Now, I'm a Brit. I've only been to, I've been to Wisconsin twice and Arizona four times. Nothing I saw in Wisconsin suggested to me on two visits that this was a place where people were unlikely to vote for Trump. They've got a huge history of, of both right-wing and left-wing voter eccentricity. But the data overruled the instinct. In the case of Nokia, there's a brilliant TEDx Cambridge speech from an anthropologist who discovered that Nokia's idea that nobody would buy smartphones from the developing world because they were too expensive 
An anthropologist went in and said, I've been doing work in China in refugee camps, and when a smartphone becomes available, even if it's just an iPhone knockoff, people will sacrifice half their disposable income to own one. So all your data, now remember, all big data comes from one place, which is the past, right? And all the data they had, the 500,000 data points, were all based on what people would pay for a feature phone. Change the context to make it a smartphone, all the rules change. And she went back to them and they said, yeah, but you're an anthropologist, you've got 150 data points. We've got uh, about 500,000. And McKinsey have done some work with us and they show that the amount people will pay for a phone is basically this. So we need to hold off launching smartphones for another three years. And so they won the argument basically on the basis of who had the most data. When you think about it, iceberg dead ahead is only one data point, isn't it? The fact is, it's just quite an important one. So one of the things we've got to do is, there isn't an algorithm, by the way. Now, I know you don't like the guy. I don't like him much, OK? But you've got to admit, this is kind of brilliant, OK? I don't know any algorithm which will ever produce that. Now, you've got to understand this, OK? You're an American, and you're a guy, OK? And what it says is, I've got my own plane, but I eat the same food you do, admittedly with a knife and fork. Um, <laughs> It shows, I suppose it shows his responsible side in that he's waiting for his gravy to cool down below the surface temperature of the sun before he opens it on a moving vehicle. But that, one of them is the data thing will never generate something as incredibly lucid and potent as that is. Yeah, I'm not asking you to like it, but I think you've just got to recognize it. And so one of the interesting things about context is that Many of the things we argue about might just be the same thing in a different context. And this is one of the most interesting sentences I've read in five years, which is an American political thinker um, uh, called uh, Vincent Graham. And he explains his politics as being context dependent. He says, at the federal level, I, across the US, I'm a libertarian. At the state level, I'm a Republican. At the town level, I'm a Democrat. And by my family and friends, I'm a socialist. And with my dog, I'm a Marxist, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. And the understanding that humans are hugely contextually dependent is, again, the curse of behavioral science, but it's the gift of everybody in this room. Because if it gives us a license, at the very least, to experiment non-catastrophically with different contexts, we've just justified what marketing is for 10 times over. You know, if you think about it, nobody was going to Mr. Dyson 20 years ago and saying, I'm really annoyed because I'm looking for an opportunity to spend more money on a vacuum cleaner, okay? There was no data point that was going to tell you that. No one ever told Starbucks, you know, it really pisses me off that I can't spend $5 on a coffee, okay? So contextual, and by the way, a lot of the things, is they're kind of true. What research might tell you is true in one context, bullshit in another. You know, there are some shops where a £200 bag is expensive. There are shops where a £200 bag is cheap. If anybody spent, thank you, if anybody spent any time in Sunglass Hut, you'll know that effect. You've just got to spend about eight minutes in Sunglass Hut at Terminal 5, and suddenly an 80-pound pair of spectacles seems really reasonable, okay? <laughs> now, I'm just going to take you, just with a weird maths lesson for the last three minutes, okay, which just fascinates me. Um, Ole is a mathematician at the London Mathematical Laboratory. He couldn't be with us today because he said, I'd rather do some maths. And I said, OK, that's mathematicians for you, basically. OK, there is a joke I could tell, but I haven't got time. Um, now, I want you to think about this, OK? I want you to look at this bet where you put some money down, and if you win, you get 50% more, and if you lose, you lose 40%, OK? And I want you to think whether that's a good bet. Gain 50% heads, tails lose 40%. And your first instinct in looking at the thing is going to go, that looks like pretty good upside. In fact, I'm going to put a lot of money in, and I'm going to tell the guy to start tossing the coin, and I'm going to tell him basically, let the winnings roll, uh, let the winnings ride, and I'm just off to, you know, basically I'm off to Mauritius to enjoy, enjoy my gains. You'd all look at that bet in that way, wouldn't you? Because look at it in this way, mathematically, okay? Uh, you've got four people, okay, and two, on average, two will throw heads, two will throw tails, uh, two of them get 150, two of them get 60. The net of that is, let me get this right, 320, uh, 420 quid. They started with 400, so that's a 5% gain. Okay? So you're getting this bet's pretty good, isn't it? Does anybody not want to take that bet? This is fascinating. Right. You can make a fortune, essentially. Let's look at it now from a different perspective. Now, 
Ole will explain that this is to do with the fact that all economics and most mathematical models assume real life is ergodic, which it isn't. Don't look up ergodic in Wikipedia because blood will start to come out from your ears. It's a, it's a, it's a term in statistical mechanics, okay? But nearly all models of rationality don't make proper allowance for time. They assume that life's a one-shot hit, and what's good on one shot is therefore good for you. And, they, and at the collective perspective, that's a win, isn't it? We're increasing net wealth by 5%. Let's look what happens if you actually have two bets. One guy ends up with 225 quid. He's loaded. The total, indeed, is considerably higher than 400. Okay? Three of them are worse off than they were when they started. And the poor sod on the right with two tails, he's now got to throw three heads in a row just to get his original stake back. Looked at from an individual perspective, this is a bad bet. Looked at from a collective perspective, it's wealth enhancing. Ole claims with Alex Adamio that this explains things like, for example, the existence of insurance as a business, which takes collective gains and, and uses them to minimize individual losses. But none of you here had ever thought that that was, that was a distinction that mattered before. Do you look at it from one person's point of view over time? In other words, do you, you, most of you consider, and for one weird reason or another, the human brain considers that the ensemble outcome is the same as the time series outcome. If you play that game a million times, a few people for a short time always end up insanely rich everybody else ends up skinned. And so one of the things I was chatting to Ole about, because um, I, actually uh, the, the, uh, there's an excellent chap here called Peter Day from Quantcast. One of my great worries about big data is there are far more big data sets than there are mathematicians competent enough to handle them. And if you speak to super competent mathematicians, they're much, much more skeptical about the potential of big data than fairly competent ones are. A lot of them will go, yeah, you can do regression analysis, but it's basically bullshit, you know, okay? And one of the best mathematicians I know says, effectively, the A-B split test is still the only gold standard for finding anything out. But I chatted to Ole, and I found it very interesting talking to really, really good mathematicians. So one of the things we assume is that one times seven is the same as seven times one. Now, that seems a bit weird. Obviously, it is, isn't it? But if you look at a mathematical model of people, this is my great objection to high speed two. You all came down, or a lot of you came down on high speed one, okay? If you move to Folkestone, which I highly recommend, the weather's always like this, um, okay? High speed one saves you an hour a day, 200 times a year. So that's one person saving 200 hours a year. That is a huge psychological game changer. It means you can move house, it means it can change your life, okay? What High Speed 2 does to Manchester, because nobody's going to commute from Manchester to London, is it saves 200 people one hour once a year. Now, to the model used by transport planners, which is psychology-free, they treat that time-saving as if it's completely the same. Okay? Now, anybody who just thinks about it for a second goes, no, they're completely different. And yet, it's perfectly acceptable to have a model of transport where one person saving an hour 200 times is basically considered the same as the reverse. Another Shut up your yeah, face. No, I get it, I get it, I get it. No, it's my last slide, but one, anyway. Another weird thing, which is childish maths, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is bigger than 3 times 1 times 1 times 3 times 3 times 1. Variance reduction in a non-ergodic stochastic environment, which is a fancy term for real life, okay, Simply reducing variance is a rational strategy because you end up better off if you basically minimize gains and losses. What that means is that human rationality, once you accept the fact that what a lot of people are trying to do unconsciously and instinctively is not to achieve optimal results, it's to reduce the variance of the outcome, that means that 10 times more things can be considered rational behavior than if you don't include variance in the model. And this is fascinating because I would argue that that's a large part of the instinctive appeal of brands. We don't buy brands because we think they're better. We pay a premium for them because we think they're less likely to be shite. You know, I mean, you know, actually, you know, the idea of maximization, if you look at it, evolution has to calibrate us this way. There's one thing that evolution has to do a good job of is basically calibrating our approach to risk. So what fascinates me is even mathematics, which we think of as the purest thing of all, 
can deliver completely different conclusions if you just look at it from a different context or a different direction. And the reason this totally fascinates me is because I think looking at context experiments is genuinely the biggest future gain we can possibly imagine in terms of behavior change, in terms of marketing, in terms of business. And I'll end with one suggestion, which I've, I've discussed with very good economists who generally agree with me, okay? No one in the diversity debate thinks that 10 people each hiring one person, they think is going to be the same as one person hiring 10 people, okay? If you look at what the brain does instinctively when you hire people in groups, when you hire in individually, you hire for conformity. When you hire in groups, you hire for complementarity. Now, you can understand that in the car market. You know what I mean about look for patterns, right? No one, when, when everybody had one car when I was a kid, everybody had a saloon car, okay? Because that was like the compromise car, okay? It was the white middle-class male of the automotive world, okay? When people have face. two cars, and this is the last slide, don't worry. When people have two cars, the rules totally change. You don't have two saloon cars. In fact, you possibly don't even have one. So one of the most important things in the diversity debate, which is really, really important, because if we actually solve it badly, the cure will be worse than the disease, is to look at the way in which we hire. When you hire one person at a time, people are disproportionately risk-averse and basically hire people for absolute conformity. The, and I can end on this with a perfect proof point. The only reason I got my job in Ogilvy in 1988 was there were four jobs going. If there'd been one job going, I wouldn't have stood a chance. But they couldn't decide, having decided on the first three applicants, and somebody at the back said, let's take a punt on the weirdo. So that's me. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you.